a show that highlights the fascinating stories and thought-provoking moments that make up our lives. My name is Xavier Diaz, and I want to hear your story. How are you today, Soraya? I'm absolutely wonderful. And how are you? Uh, doing very, very well. Always happy to be joined with amazing leaders that have started organizations to raise awareness about things that they're passionate about. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, how you started Color Me Africa, and your background. You have an amazing uh origin story, like background story that I was reading on the website, and I want the listeners to hear because it's not every day you get to speak to somebody who, you know, immigrated from Africa during apartheid, so it's really, really cool to, to get to speak with you. Thank you so much. Yep, so I was born and raised in Johannesburg, South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, during apartheid, and um you know, we went through a really terrible time experiencing real oppression mm -hmm. and real segregation. Now, you know, one would look at me and say, well, what are you? Because you're not black and I'm certainly not white. Mm -hmm. And that was always this, this dichotomy we were living with. There were those of us, much like in the United States, where people look lighter skinned. Mm -hmm. And um, But my background is my great-grandmother was a black woman. Mm -hmm. My mother was mixed with German and black. Mm -hmm. And that's how this gene pool shifted over time. But in South Africa, if you had any kind of percentage of black, you were considered non-white. Mm -hmm. And you... Uh, or the brunt of the laws that were created to oppress you, to segregate you, to subjugate you, to deny you from all the wonders of what's possible for any human being. And those were just basic human things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, as I grew up, I really um, became aware that I'm living in a society of separate people. And, you know, you would learn that you can't go there. You're not allowed to go there. You can't live in that place. You aren't allowed to go to university. Mm -hmm. Or you, you're not paid. Or, you know, you read the paper and you find out it's for whites only jobs. Mm -hmm. Not whites need not apply. You'd see that written in the newspaper. If you let me uh, just intervene. So what would that do for you growing up, knowing that there were these ceilings that you would never be able to get past? Like, you know, no matter how far you push yourself, there are these regulations in place that are there to literally prevent you from moving up in the world. How did that affect you growing up? Um, well, there's a lot of depression, mm -hmm. a lot of um, uh, uh, self-hate, Mm -hmm. anger, resentment, um, just a lot of a lot of emotional unsettledness. Mm -hmm. And you see people with who are white are doing all these things that you would hope to do, would dream to do, but you know you'd never be able to. And mm -hmm. it, you, you don't realize that it's not be, it, 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 when you're young, you don't realize it's because of what the law says you begin to believe that it's because of your race. Mm -hmm. How you were born. You were born not to do those things. You were mm -hmm. born not to have those things. You were born not to be bright. That is traumatic. That is like, That crushes motivation. Right? And mm -hmm. it, it, it literally had you believe my race is, is because I'm this race, therefore I can't. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I won't even try. And I had the nerve to love art and want to pursue the creative fields, mm -hmm. but there was no outlet for me. Mm -hmm. They did not teach art in the schools because they had a special education for people of color. Mm -hmm. And I would say non-whites, but I hate that word because those are the words that were created by the oppressor. Mm -hmm. So... So, for example, I wanted to do fashion designing. 
Mm -hmm. And I apply, went to school in Pretoria, which is sort of like the racist capital of the country at the time. And I was told, you can't come here. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to come here. Wow. And it crushed me. I didn't even know. No one prepared me for such a response. That's horrible. (laughs) And so it just kind of left you with very few options in life. Mm -hmm. And most of the options, unfortunately, women would get married. They drop out of school. And the the conversations were, what's the point? Even if you finish high school, you're still going to earn a menial wage. Of course. Or there's nothing else you can do. Yeah, you will become so unmotivated. Right. And so, you know, the, the, the guys turn to drugs like you see happening here. Mm-hmm. Women dropped out of school, got married or got pregnant young. Mm-hmm. And then that's not the life you want. No. Or what are your options? Or you end up being forced into marriage because, you know, it's economically better for you. Mm-hmm. So you live this life of being forced into forced into, forced into, but never really visualizing, creating from from within or ever believing that you can fulfill a dream that you have. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to leave South Africa. Mm -hmm. I always had this dream of leaving South Africa to move to the United States ever since I was a child. Because somehow there's a place called America where dreams can be fulfilled. And Mm -hmm. that was always in the movies, in articles you read. And I remember a song that my mom would play, and it's called What a Wonderful World. Uh And the words of that song was like, I could hear the birds and I could, you know, people saying, how do you do? And like, I was a little girl and she would sing this while she's baking. And it's just like, where is this place they're talking about, you know? And then when I did finally get the opportunity to travel, that was during apartheid. And that was during my activism years. How old were you? If you don't mind me asking. My very first trip out of South Africa was to, well, I used to go to Mozambique regularly as a child. Mm -hmm. And then Mozambique was colonized by the Portuguese. However, it was a lot more liberated than South Africa. Mm -hmm. Black and white were mixing. They were marrying. They were dating. You could eat anywhere. You could live anywhere. And it had, it was a colony And it did have its own oppression, but we didn't see it. Mm -hmm. Um, But not the same version of it. Yeah. So anytime we would go there, it was like a world opened up. And then anytime we would go back, it was like the gates were shutting, Mm -hmm. you know, to this other life. And um, but that was our, our, our escape. And it's a six, seven, eight hour drive and then you're in the free in the free land almost you know yeah and do you think that made you like angry towards south africa knowing like I why is my home like this viciously angry mm-hmm. i grew up as an i was an angry angry child i can imagine i was and and ironically when in my 20s i met um a friend of mine now some of us not some of us but Many of those who looked like complected took advantage of that by playing right. Mm-hmm. And they had went to places that ordinarily they would not have been able to go to because of their complexion. So a friend of mine invited me to a music festival. And this was an all white music festival. And I was so nervous because I'd never been in an ocean of white people. <laughs> wow. It's, and I it's was so, so interesting. That they, would, they would know that I'm not and they would ask me to leave. But you and are even, very light skinned. Like, right? you would think that you just tanned, that you got a good tan that day. No, but when you live among your own, your brain is programmed to think you look like everyone else. Mm-hmm. Right? So I went to this festival, and oh, everyone was like, oh, wow, she's so beautiful. Who is she? You know, and I gave my, and I oh, call yourself Sue because you don't want them to know. By your name, Soraya. Yeah, that they would know you're not supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. 
And so I was Sue for the day. <laughs> and at some point, this one young woman befriended me and she kept staring at me and she decided she needed to get to know me. Mm-hmm. And so the guy, the friend who took me there was having such a good time. He got so drunk. He passed out and she said, well, I can't obviously let you go home with him. We need to take you home. But now I need to tell her Where I live you in live. a non-white neighborhood. Oh, my God. That okay. is no- And what did you do? What did you do? I, 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 I said, I, I, I don't, I didn't tell her where I lived. She said, come with us to a party. Okay. So I said, okay. And this was an all white party. And I was so, so nervous. I, I was shy. I was withdrawn. And all I wanted to do was leave. And I don't drink and I don't smoke weed. And everybody's getting high and everything. And at some point she said, I tell you what, why don't you stay at my place? I'll take you home tomorrow. And I'm still not telling her where I live. So now I'm staying in a white hot woman's apartment under South African law that's illegal. Wow. Because there's a law called, there is a law called the Group Areas Act. Mm-hmm. It was, I would have to get permission from a police station to be in her neighborhood. Oh now I'm God. sleeping in her house. And then the next, that same night I spoke to her and I said, listen, my name is Soraya and I'm Indian mix and I live in this area she was blown away she was like oh my god I'm so sorry she was so sad she was so I was surprised she was feeling so terrible and then she took me home and met my mom and my family and we became friends and we've been friends to this day wow that really it, it, those laws are so depressing when you hear stories like that because it's like past the skin color once you get to know somebody like it doesn't matter what their skin color is it's just if their personality is good and these laws literally prevent you from meeting other people like that that you could have an amazing friendship with so that story is both inspiring and makes me sad because of the stupid laws that were created at that time and then it was the beginning of like my my experience of what it's like to live in a South Africa where they have all these privileges. Mm-hmm. And then she got to learn to look at what it's like to be in my world where mm-hmm. there were none. Yeah, wow. And Two societies just, right there. We, we, we went through this incredible story. Now, we really do have a story as friends that we have yet to, to talk about. Fast forward, I wanted to get out. I got so restless. She was able to fulfill on my dream. I wanted to be a flight attendant because I knew I'd get out. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't allow me to because I was Mm non-white. And so she would travel the world and come and tell me about the world. And all I could do was listen. Wow, that's depressing. And then one day I met someone, we fell in love, and he wanted to travel. And that's how I started to see the world. Uh, nice. And it was from that moment, I realized, I mean, I remember my very first visit to London and I saw white people sweeping streets mm. or white people picking up garbage or going to a restaurant and there's a white woman sitting in the bathroom giving you a tissue or giving you, <laughs> you know, like you never saw white people in those positions. Yeah. And that blew me away. And I'm like... I want more. I want to see more, you know, and I was fortunate enough to travel so much and for so long around the world. By 1976, I I had become this political person, 76, 87, from 76 to 87, actually. Mm -hmm. I just became so, so political and I knew I needed to do help do something about this country mm-hmm. and my what i did was just really educate people because we had censorship in the country so all those trips abroad allowed me to bring in what the government deemed as subversive material mm-hmm. and i would bring video footage and i would bring you know photographs and i would show in small groups what is happening in south africa mm-hmm. and that opened many people's eyes, but I also stood the risk of somebody telling on me. Mm-hmm. And it 
and we would just have to hide whatever we were showing and we would just, you know, separate and blah, blah, blah. And there just came a point, I remember reading in the paper um, that the, 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 like there were, came there came a time where I was I moved into a, a building for example, but my the the person who rent I rented it from was a lawyer friend, <clears throat> mm-hmm. and he said, look, I know you guys have housing issues, I, I I and I needed to live closer to work. Can and he said you can rent my place, sublet it from me. Mm-hmm. But then while I was there. I had a plumbing issue and I went to the caretaker and she said, what are you doing there? You're not supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's illegal. I'm going to have to call the police on you. And I said, "Uh, okay, I'll be out. She said, you've got 24 hours. So that was again, breaking that law. Mm -hmm. I eventually discovered the following morning early that there was a, Indian gentleman with his friend living in the penthouse and found out he's the owner and he lives there. And I did what I had to do to meet him. And I said to him, you know what, if I move, you move and the doctor moves. And I never heard from them again. Uh, And then I I literally let them know that this ain't going to happen. And what I did then... (laughs) What I did then was I asked all my friends who were struggling for housing to find a white friend who would lease it and sublet it. And by the time I left that building, it was about 60% people of color. Wow. So you've been doing work like this for a long time. Yes. Yes. Mm. And then I ended up looking for another place because now I need more space. I have a dog and I'm feeling all this power. And I picked up the phone one day and I saw this beautiful wonderful townhouse and I said to the guy listen I'd like to rent it but I'm not going to rent it in a white name can I have it on my name and he said sure oh and so things were starting to get a little starting to better. change mm-hmm. yes so this was the gray area people were starting to move into these gray areas and then I remember reading the Sunday paper one morning and the, the government was saying you need to start reporting these people mm. you started to crack and down he, on it that day, I said, I'm getting out. Mm-hmm. I can't raise my kids here. I can't mm-hmm. live here. It's killing me. No matter how much work you put into it, it was it's still an crazy. uphill battle. Yes. So I left. And I came to this country knowing that I wanted to do something with my life. But then I realized wanting freedom and knowing how to live in freedom was a very different thing. Mm. Like I had to learn to be free. Oh, can you can you tell me about that? Because that's that's something I never really thought about having to learn to be free. When you've been when you've been raised in an oppressed society and subjugated for so long, and listen, it was just what I was twenty seven at the time. Mm-hmm. My formidable years and all of those years after that was only knowing oppression and restrictions and and not not even knowing myself. Mm. And the journey from having to uncover that has been a very long journey. And I'm talking years. And and this is through many kinds of modalities. Um, And I'll tell you, being able to just know it's okay to move about freely, to -hmm. get on a bus with anybody and everybody, Mm -hmm. to to sit next to people who are white and all colors, to eat in restaurants. I mean, even that was a game. We couldn't couldn't eat in restaurants. Mm -hmm. Um, To think for myself Mm -hmm. and be able to create what I want and trust that what I'm thinking and wanting to create is good for me. Because you were always told what to do and how to think. Mm-hmm. And and it was, I'm writing a book about that. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was very, very um, painful to unravel apartheid mm-hmm. in my brain. And what the bottom line is, is that I discovered that I was a victim and lived life from a place of victimization. And because they were the victimizers, 
they you be just would like I am victim. Yeah, that, that's, that's just you how think. it is. Mm-hmm. You don't know any other way to think. Mm-hmm. And and then discovering my voice and discovering my power, discovering my humanity, discovering just the beauty of 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 what I experience, and that I no longer have to look there, and that I can actually be a force for healing, and a force for transformation, mm-hmm. and that led me to uh, uh, um, wanting to do something for the country that I knew I could contribute in some way. Mm-hmm. And art spoke to me. My son is an artist; he's a visual artist. I was an artist and never got to express it professionally. So I wanted to work with these artists, and so I visited to South Africa in 2011. I was in a coffee shop waiting on a friend, and they had a pop-up show in this really fancy mall, outdoorsy mall. And I struck up a conversation with the guy who was um, managing this pop-up. Mm-hmm. He is an artist from Zimbabwe, and. Uh, I looked at the work and I'm like, oh my, this is beautiful. And 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 just, you know, I've always traveled and always bought art. Mm-hmm. And so our home was like a big art gallery, you know, just art everywhere. So I realized, hmm, I've never seen such gorgeous pieces. How much are they? And he showed me. And then he said to me, but don't buy those because those the, the guy who run owns these pieces is a um, dealer. Mm-hmm. in diamonds and it deals art but what they do is they go to the townships mm-hmm. and they'll buy the art for next to nothing mm-hmm. and you'll see those prices there because mm-hmm. they are marketing it to tourists wow so it's just taking advantage of of because these artists who actually make them have no other outlet where to present it or that, how to sell it the language to speak about it you mm-hmm. know they mm-hmm. have they don't speak english mm-hmm they just create. So there's a lot of dealers that take advantage of that and then resell it to tourists because tourists think that they're buying something genuinely from Africa and in supporting the culture without knowing how what these dealers are doing. Right. Mm-hmm. So it touched a nerve for me because when I was young, I did modeling a little, a few years of that, trying it out, and I was always placed with the white crowd because of my complexion but they knew I wasn't but I had a look they wanted and I was very oblivious to how things worked I was young and naive and I got I, I often didn't get paid for the work and I remember sitting in a hair salon for a shoot I did um, I got some, some small amount of money but I was so happy to be chosen if that often happened to us that you just accept what they give you. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember sitting in a hair salon waiting to get my hair done, and I'm looking at this woman at the magazine, and I see my face. On a magazine? On a magazine, and I never got paid for that. Wow. Yeah, and it was a top-name company, a very top brand in the country, and even probably it's a, it was a European company. Now, I know if a white person had got done a shoot that and they had a modeling agency they worked through, this that was just I was just discovered, oh my god, you've got the perfect look for this. Mm-hmm. So, that was that was what I recalled, and I said, you know what, I want to know who these guys are, and I want to know how they operate. And I got to know them, and I got to know how they operate. And when I went to the, the, the their space, they had the guy by his own admission said, "We have a, we've been collecting for fifteen years. We've got about twenty five thousand pieces rolled up, and most of it are from the apartheid era." Mm-hmm. And that just broke my heart because these artists I know died poor, yeah, or I know died unknown, mm-hmm. and. And then as I got to know some of the more how they operate, then I researched some of the artists in the collection they sent to me. And I discovered, I found these artists, I tracked them down, and they started to tell me their stories. And I actually engaged the guy and I said to him, I would love 
for you to, to do, do a project with you. And if you bring some out to the United States, we'd like to exhibit them. And he thought he found his contact mm. to bring work here. What he didn't realize is I had engaged the South African government to work with me because I shared the story with them. Mm -hmm. And we did, we, we brought art from the apartheid era and art from post-apartheid mm -hmm. to show the work and share that story. And when he heard what I was doing, they backed off. Mm -hmm. And then it started to just unravel. So what I did with the work is I actually used that as seed money to create Color Me Africa Fine Arts. Mm. And and as and and to tell to build the story on those. And so subsequently the artists that I featured, that I, 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 I had, some of the work that I had, we were able to bring one of those artists from a township living out of a shack. Mm -hmm. No lights, no water. I have images of where he lives. I got him to get his passport. I coached him on how to do that, how to get a visa. Three times he got declined by the embassy because in his broken English, he said, I'm going to work there. Not the thing you want to say to a, an embassy official. No. So I finally got, I finally got our, our senator's office to help me this is an exhibition. They'll be in and out. Mm -hmm. He got his visa. He had never left his township. We put him on a plane. We picked him up in a limo, put him in one of the best hotels on Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and took him to a show in Chicago. What a life-changing event. <laughs> did, did he speak English? No. No, much. oh my God, what a life-changing experience. <laughs> and, but fortunately for him, he was traveling with another artist who had done some traveling. So I selected her to come with him. We were funded by the government. And we had two South Africans who live here, one in, in LA and one in New York. And so they all converged on Chicago. And we had four South African artists, my first ever sort of international project getting funded and all of that. And it was celebrating uh, the 20th. Uh, oh, yeah, it was our celebrating our 20 years of democracy. Wow. So there we were. And he literally has gone from that artist who nobody really knew much about to going back to South Africa, and now he's in galleries. Oh, my God, amazing. You changed his life. You literally and, changed his whole life. And then, uh, and, and, and it has expanded since. So that is just one example of what's possible. And what really bothered me about that, that whole incident with the, uh, the dealer was they've been exploiting South Africans for as long as forever, now we have a democracy and we still have this problem. Mm -hmm. So apparently the guy shut his, was sh he shut his business down, sold the collection to somebody uh, uh, foreign and no longer does business. And then we discovered another one like that and mm -hmm. that too got shut down. No. So we, that was the intent. And we accomplished that. So where are we now? We're 501c3. Mm -hmm. And our mission is to educate, inspire, uplift, and, um, and, and, and bring artists and, ex and, and support and sponsor and exhibit works by artists that you would never get to see, you'll never get to know. Um, uh, unless we bring them here. Mm -hmm. And also we will be able to, um, you know, go and develop them further so they, they too can grow and become Picassos of the world. Amazing. And I, I read on your website that it's a touring platform. So you bring these shows globally and you expose people to these diverse African cultures. What is like the reception when people go to these shows and maybe they've never seen South African art or they've never heard like a story as powerful as this? What's the general reception that you get when you throw these exhi exhibits? So our last show, we had 14 artists, mm -hmm. a very diverse group, men, women, age-wise and gender and race. Mm -hmm. And in New York, 
And I have to tell you, blew people away. I mean, they kept coming. They like had never seen this type of work. They, when they think of Africa, they don't get to see that side of Africa. It's often poverty. It's often corruption and crime and sort of the dark continent, which mm -hmm. is why when you see our logo, it's this bright, beautiful, colorful continent because I'm an African. I look and sound like this. And there are many of us that look like this. And we love our Africa. Mm -hmm. Africa lives in us all, whites alike. It doesn't leave you, and no matter where you go. And so, you know, when people came, they were like just blown away. And I know people who are in the arts at maybe high levels or from, from institutions, they came to the show and they were like, wow. Wow, we've never seen anything like this. Please do more like this. We see the same old, same old, same old. This was sort of like a fresh breath of air for them. Wow. So I know that we are, and when we say touring platform, uh, we, we, were, so we plan on having our own gallery space. Mm -hmm. This ends the fundraising period for us, giving, to giving Tuesday get, kicks off today. Mm -hmm. So please support Color Me Africa Fine Arts so we can bring more of those wonderful works, wonderful opportunities for you to meet the artists. We don't just want to bring art. We want the artists here. We want to share their rich stories. We want their voices heard. Um, and by the way, the guy who couldn't speak English has learned, now learns to speak very good English, by the way. So that inspired him to go and develop himself further. Um, and um, people want to have a piece of that, you know, in their in their homes. And the prices are ranges from three hundred to three thousand mm -hmm. and up. Um, but there's something affordable for everyone to have, and it's very personal. And 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 you will not believe the lives you touch when you do this. Yeah. African art is on fire right now. <laughs> And, 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 it, and it's, I think Africa definitely is the future. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I made a decision that this is my life's work and I'm going to see it through. So we will have a gallery in Chicago, hopefully by the end of this year. Wow, amazing. Thank you. Like that's, that's really beautiful that you provide opportunities for the people that in a home, your home, Somewhere where you grew up angry, rightfully so, because of the things that were around you, things that you couldn't control, and you still decided to go back there and provide more opportunities and to uplift your people. So that's really incredible work that you're doing. Um, what do you see in the future for, for Color Me Africa? What do you hope to have, like, let's say five years from now? Where do you see the organization? Well, wow. So we are, we are now also registered as a nonprofit in South Africa, and we plan mm -hmm. to have our own gallery there. And the space there would provide uh, us with a platform to continue to harvest new talent uh, from the rest of the continent to, 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 or to source them um, and to create those, uh, use art as a platform for healing for engaging each other uh, on the continent. There's a lot of xenophobia that happened in South Africa because we had such a huge influx of uh, immigrants who fled their countries to come to South Africa when we opened to this new democracy. Mm -hmm. um, I, what I see in five years, I see uh, our, our presence in all of the major shows around the world. You know, a demand for the for the talent that we have to be featured, um, to be to have a footprint in um, you know in, in in all these major cities of the United States, Canada, Latin America, South America, and uh, and and for artists to know that there's a place that they will be a respected, protected, and nurtured. Mm, beautiful. And their dreams can be fulfilled. And really more than anything for a young Suraya that could wish she had seen an organization that said, go ahead, paint, mm. create, 
believe because there is a place for you when you're ready. I have my youngest artist. He is superbly talented coming out of Cape Town. He's only 12. You must see the work he creates. And so, I, I mean, he's looking at Surya. Surya is going to take this and help us do this. So, you know, I was a mother. I'm a mother for grown-ups. I only know how to mother. These are like my kids. And they give me the reason I wake up in the morning. And. Wow. And more importantly, I did meet Nelson Mandela. I had the distinct privilege of meeting him. I was just going to ask you, I was like, I can't end this interview without talk, talking about this. You told me this on the phone. You got the chance to meet him. What, what was that like, that experience? Okay. So I was actually at the time living in, um, so, you know, I, I, so when I left the country, I said to my mom, I'm not coming back until Nelson Mandela is a free man. I worked in the Free Nelson Mandela campaign. A lot of my friends were arrested, many of which just disappeared. And um, we fought hard to for his release. And then we knew, you know, we realized it's not going to happen. In, but I left the country saying, if he's not coming home, I'm not coming home. Mm -hmm. The day he was released, this was six years after I, I had gone, left the country, hadn't returned. I'm living in Panama, Central America, and the husband says to me, turn on the TV. And there's Nelson Mandela walking out of prison, and I'm bawling my eyes out, and I'm oh. ready to go home because I had kept my, I've been away for six years, right? So I, uh, while I was still, you know, in Panama, we have a house in D.C., that I'm managing, I took a trip to D.C. and I called my friends at the embassy, still under the older, older apartheid, but they knew us. And they said to me, Nelson Mandela is here. I said, oh, well, I have to see him. They said, um, he's going to be meeting with all the exiles in a hotel in the city. And I said, I, I, I have to be there. They said, we'll get, so they got me a police, um, State Department clearance. Wow. And I did get to see. And so we were a handful of us. And we they discussed the future of the country. And we all had to declare to him our promise to go back and help rebuild our country. And you are fulfilling that promise. And I said, I will do that. I can't promise when, but I will do that. So I did not know at the time what it would be. But everything I did was to develop myself and to grow and, 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 and become so that I can actually do it. Mm -hmm. and But I was restless because I was, or, you know, I was a mom and then I did this and I did, and everything I was doing was not giving me the freedom to go. Mm -hmm. So when the market tanked in 2011, I was in real estate and I lost everything. Mm -hmm. I lost my homes and my money and all that. And I said, it's a perfect time to go home. Mm -hmm. And it was during that period when I discovered a week before I left the country a year later, literally one year of discovering New South Africa, a week before I'm about to get on a plane, I discovered this pop-up art show. And in that moment, in that moment, I made that choice. This is the path I'm taking. Mm -hmm. And I never looked back. And so I keep a, a, a photo of Nelson Mandela near and dear to me so I can remember what I promised him no matter how hard it's going to get and believe me it's been very tough financially um, you know I'm starting with not a dime not a dime a little 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 tablet a little phone in a coffee shop using the internet I started there and look at wow and I just kept going not knowing how I was going to get to the next day, if I'm going to pay my telephone bill, if I'm going to eat. I have to do this. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen now. I don't know how, but I'm going to keep going. And I just kept going. Wow. And, and like the experience you had growing up where things weren't available for you, resources weren't available for you because of how you were born. Now knowing I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it because it can be done. There's nothing stopping me. That has to be such a huge motivator. Like that's, it's such a beautiful story. It really is like, <laughs> <laughs> this I, is... I, I'm just thinking about it now. 
now because I haven't really taken the time to. And the the crazy thing is, I'm I, I was given by the mayor of Chicago uh, a, a a resolution honoring uh, 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 honoring or acknowledging or whatever a proclamation the work of Color Me Africa is doing for artists. Like who who does that? <laughs> Amazing. And before we we end this interview, can you tell me a little bit about the two pieces you have behind you because they are beautiful and so eye catching and vibrant. Thank you. So um, that young guy is my uh, mascot. Mm -hmm. I saw an image. I saw that image on Facebook. And I wonder, I'm like, oh my god, who is the art? And I met all these artists really from seeing the images on Facebook. And I'm like, I gotta know you, and I've gotta know you. So this piece here, the the, the thinking boy, thinking boy is his name, and uh, I fell in love with him, and I met the artist because of him, and she's one of my my best friends now. She's turns out she's a white South African, and. At the beginning of our journey, we were only focusing on Black South Africans, but I, I, I moved away from that conversation to include all South Africans, mm. and uh, because that's the future. And and when I brought her to the New York show, the she painted that. No, she gave me that as a gift because that was the beginning of our story together. Um, she's a, 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 an incredible. Her name is Leoda. Conrad, she is a brilliant artist. Her father was an artist. Um, this lady is incredibly generous and kind, and 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 and, and nurturing, and 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 does so much for the community. And I realized that I discovered a true, true gem when I met her. And my promise to her is that we will do a solo show at our gallery when when we open. Um, and I have a, another woman here the, with the trees. She uh, is actually an Indian woman, Premila. And you'll hear all these exotic names around Kalami Africa because they're from all over. Uh, Premila lived in Africa for many, many, many years and, and moved back to India. But she, Africa never left her. Mm -hmm. All of her landscapes are of the African continent. And she does a series in just trees, and they are absolutely outstanding. Um, and you'll see more of her work on the website. And then that day, her name is Nobu Kosi. This artist is from Mozam from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we um, oh my, I worked with the Harlem Fine Art Show, and the guy asked me to if he could take the show, this piece, and sell it for us in New York. They came to Chicago. He actually ran off with that piece. And I went after him. And I used ABC 7 on your side. He took off with two pieces. And wow, we he, got, just took them? He, he just took them and he just never sent them back. And because we exposed him in, with the, in the news and we went through all kinds of channels, this piece got returned to us, partially damaged, but she came home. Wow. Um, so we deal with that too here. Mm -hmm. uh, we went. We trusted him by being in his in his big show at the Harlem Fine Art Show in 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 Harlem at the at the um, Riverside Church, and um, and the same thing happened to my guy who came out of the townships. He took a piece from him and never paid him and and sold it for twelve thousand dollars. Never paid him. So that's happening here too with artists, and I'm told in a very big way. Wow, that's horrible because artists put so much work into these just to have them stolen by someone who didn't do anything other than just uh, resell it. Really, yep. really horrible. Yep, and that's really the work um, you'll see a lot more on the website and, mm -hmm. of course, on our Instagram. And uh, hopefully we could create a video for you. Yeah, where tell everyone where actually... they can... Okay, so you can go to um, www.colormeafricafinearts.com mm -hmm. and um, take a look. And then we also have our Facebook page, Color Me Africa Fine Arts, on Instagram as well as on Facebook. Amazing. That is, and if you're ever back in New York, please let me know because me and my wife, we, we love art shows, we love museums, we love art, and I would love to meet you in person. I would, you've done such amazing work. Just hearing your story has been 
truly, truly inspiring. It's made me want to go do art right now after we get off of this. <laughs> and I love, oh man, like it also makes me want to go to Africa. Like just the colors, the culture. I imagine it's super beautiful and the people are very warm there. Beautiful people, wonderful weather, great food. And with the current economy, it's going to be a steal to travel there. Mm -hmm. um, the landscape, I mean, I, I, after being for a whole year back home after 25 years in 2011, I, I knew, I knew that my life would never be settled if I cut South Africa off completely. No, and I'm glad you didn't. Never and forget so your roots. I reached back home and I've been sort of narrowing the gap, narrowing that gap. And now I'm in a business that allows me to talk. I literally stay up until three to talk to my South Africa team. And then I work with my Chicago team and I get the best of both worlds. And I get to talk to my, my son there. He's a brilliant artist. He's, he's American-born, but loves it then he won't come back mm -hmm. um and you know it is a place that you cannot not go to you just have to wow well i i can't wait to go there and hopefully i get to meet you one day and i get to go to one of the galleries and the art shows and really really thank you like this was a truly inspiring interview thank you so much for coming on the show thanks for having me thank you so much Thank you to everyone who supports the show and has shared the show with a friend or a loved one. A special thank you to our guest, Soraya Shepard, founder and president of Color Me Africa Fine Arts, for coming on the show. Be sure to check out the show notes where you can find links to connect with Soraya and support her organization's mission.